In our upcoming episode, we are exploring mindfulness with licensed therapist and mindfulness coach Nicole Bartell. We're going to take a journey just discussing how stress shows up in everybody's life, but how we can use mindfulness and the practices of mindfulness, many of which a lot of us already use to help relieve the stress, anxiety, and those thoughts that we sometimes allow to take over. And so get your sip ready, get your eat ready, and let's go on a journey of mindfulness. Hello, sippers. Get ready for the set podcast where we sip, eat, talk, the ultimate blend of flavors and conversations. I'm Gina, your host, culinary enthusiast, and spirited conversationalist. Each episode, we'll explore diverse topics, share laughs, and savor the moment with special guests. Sip on insights, eat up knowledge, and join the conversation. Be sure to follow us on Instagram and YouTube at Sip Eat Talk Podcast. Subscribe now for a journey that's as delicious as it is insightful. Let's sip, eat, and talk together. Cheers. Hello, sippers. Welcome to the Sip Podcast where we sip, eat, talk. I'm your host, Gina. That's right. I called you sippers. Whether you're drinking your favorite wine, mocktail, cocktail, coffee, tea, energy drink, you are a sipper. You are sipping it with me and I'm glad to have you. The audio podcast can be found on 16 different platforms. We can be found on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts. And you can also check out pod.link to check out all the various platforms that we can be found on. You can follow the podcast at Sip Eat Talk Podcast on our social media platforms of YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, and Threads. You can find me, your host, Gina, on Instagram at I am Gina Gibson. You know, this is one of my favorite segments where I am sipping in to let you guys know what I am sipping and eating on for the episode. I tried my hand at making some cupcakes and today I tried and I made an Oreo cupcake. That's right. Your girl made an Oreo cupcake. That's right. Not as fancy, you know, as it might be in some of your major bakeries, but I'm tooting my own horn. But you know, I want to know what you guys are eating and sipping on for the episode. So make sure you tag us on Instagram at Sip Eat Talk Podcast. Let us see your photos of what you are eating and drinking for the episode and share some ideas with us. In March, I had the opportunity to attend the Winter Wine Festival here in Philadelphia, sponsored by Black Oak Wine Club. For this episode, since we will be talking with Nicole about mindfulness, I am sipping on some tea today, and I'm sipping on a Black-owned brand that was vending at the festival called Dorpari. It is a family-owned brand. I like their products because they have ginger uh, base teas for all of their teas because of the health benefits of the ginger. And today I am sipping on their ginger pineapple tea. So please check them out. I'm going to put a link in the description for uh, their website and their Instagram. So, you know, Miss Greedy, you already know I need to take a bite on camera for y'all. I've been holding on to this since I made it. Mm hmm. Mm -mm. You know I'm dancing. You know I'm dancing. Popping my head. Mm -mm. So get ready for me as we move into our discussion with Nicole Bartel, our licensed therapist and mindfulness coach. Raise it up with me and cheers for a great episode. It's so hard to call you Nicole because you know I want to call you Coley. Everyone listening, I refer to Mrs. <laughs> Bartel as Coley. Welcome, Coley, to the Set Podcast. We are so happy to have you. Thank you for having me, Gina. Well, you know the first question I'm starting out with is, what are you over there sipping on today, Coley? Well, I decided to make myself some sparkling mango water with Ooh. strawberry slices. Ooh, wait, Very what refreshing. Kind of, with strawberry slices? Yes. We like it. Yes. They already know what I'm drinking. But, uh, you know, in the spirit of mindfulness, I have one of my calming teas. So mm. let's cheers it up with our uh, mocktail and tea for a good episode. Cheers. Yeah. I don't think I share with everybody, but this is my parents' wedding china. My parents in July will have been married 54 years. So this wedding wow. china is from 1970. Yes. You does not drop it. <laughs> you know, I'm clumsy. <laughs> So, Coley, I, I really want to start, before we even get into the mindfulness, I want my listeners to know today that we're good friends. We yeah. met at yeah. the Morris Brown College in Atlanta, Georgia. 
Cully was one of those good, good psych majors. Um, <laughs> and so I want to talk just a little bit first about your uh, background. When you and I really, really got close, you were working for uh, the suicide hotline uh, uh, for Georgia. So did your journey in the therapy space and working in that related area start before that? Definitely. Uh, one of my first jobs was um, I was a counselor for individuals with developmental disabilities at okay. a shelter workshop. Okay. So like the first population I worked with was individuals with Down syndrome and okay. I loved them. But it wasn't until uh, I think maybe seven years later and received my master's in professional counseling. Okay. So that's kind of where I really delved into it. And I started working at the crisis hotline, um, the suicide prevention hotline for the state of Georgia. I started taking calls, clinical calls, once I was licensed, fully licensed. And that is where my trauma experience started. Okay. So I'll tell you, for the last 16 years, I've literally been working in trauma and uh, meeting people where they are in terms of what their trauma looks like and um, how to cultivate coping skills around trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, working at the call center, I was there for 14 years and um, life happens, you know, um, 2016, you know, that year was a tough year for me. And things just started coming together, even in that tough space. You know, I lost my sister uh, to multiple sclerosis that year. That year, three months after her passing, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And it took me about two years to realize it was time to make a move out of all of that trauma okay. and grief. And so I took some time off, uh, not too much time. And then I started working with uh, where I am now with the city of Atlanta. And I'm a therapist for the entire city. <laughs> so every, uh, it's the, just the municipality, every department in the city. But that includes the firefighters, policemen. Our heaviest uh, clientele um, is public safety. Uh, responding to crisis incidents in the city of Atlanta for fire, the Department of Corrections, and Atlanta APD. Just to clarify, is that when the officer somebody working in public safety is in the line of duty is something happening to them or is it um, something they're witnessing so it could be it could actually be both gina so we respond to crisis within the cities if there's a crisis uh, uh, any incident that you've heard of in the city of atlanta uh, where it has been televised and police show up we are out there on the scene to provide them support uh, we want to make sure that, you know, when they are engaged in these incidences, they have the mental capacity. They have, they're emotionally set to go back to work and when they're ready to go back to work. But we also show up when they're in crisis. And okay. that is for the entire city, though. Okay. So uh, we not only do therapy, I do training, a lot of mindfulness trainings, trainings on uh, sleep habits and sleep one-on-one and you know, it's all kind of intertwined. Right. And so just what mental health looks like, because of course this, there's still this big stigma around coming um, to see a therapist right? Um, and to tap into what that might look like. A lot of people aren't ready. You know, yeah. I tell my clients all the time, this may be your first day in therapy and it might be your last because you have to decide if you want to come back. You're not going to get, through it unless you get through it if that makes sense you kind of does have to make go sense through it it so, does make sense and so in the private uh therapy space do you have a, a particular demographic does it vary like is it just adults is it children is it couples like how does that work so because i have done and worked with i mean almost every diagnosis you could think of re I'm just going to say I do have a preference now and because okay. I can. Okay. I prefer working. I like the way that sounds. Can you say that again? Because it's, I can. <laughs> yes. Um, I actually prefer working with adults. Okay. Uh, because I've been at the city for three years and it's just like you get kind of what you get. Mm -hmm. uh, I have been working a lot with couples and I actually enjoy it. Okay. Uh, you and know, we should and note that you've been married how many years? 
I have been married. This year will be 17. So, yeah. yes. Praise God so, for that. <laughs> praise God. Okay. That's a um, long time in our community. In our age, in our age uh, demographic, I think, yeah. Yeah, I mean, 25, I'm, tw- I'm 25 and I've been married 17 years. But anyway. Did you say I'm 25 and married? I love I'm it. I'm going to math. That's your story. We rocking okay. with it. But um, I do prefer working with adults who are experiencing anxiety, mm-hmm. um, depression, mm-hmm. um, and trauma because I, I, I understand trauma and grief. The reason why I am so connected, I guess, to those diagnoses or those behaviors is because, of course, I'm a therapist. We know that on paper. But I believe because I've been doing this so long that you can't just take medication for everything. Okay. A lot of people need medication. And and I'm not saying medication does not work because it does. But you just don't want to take medication without the tools that you need to aid in, you know, dissipating, you know, we want this anxiety to go away. I'm going to take this pill, but I'm not going to do anything. And I'm waiting. I'm looking at the clock, like, but there are so many tools that you can learn um, outside of medication and coupled with medication to make your experience better. So, okay. You know, what's interesting. I, I want to take a step back for a second. I was outlining that April this month, we have a lot of those national days, right? It's a lot of those national days that have been created. And there are a few in April uh, that I feel are connect to our, our conversation. One of the reasons that I wanted to have the uh, April is National Minor- Minority Health Month. It's Stress Awareness Month. It's National Month of Hope. And it's the Move More Month, right? So we have a lot of uh, different things going in there. And, and I, I initially, when we had this conversation, you know, I wanted, I want to talk about b- mindfulness. But before we get into that, I hope that you can help explain something uh, to our listeners who may or may not know, because trauma is a word that is used a lot in our society. And sometimes in talking to people, people think trauma and they think, oh, you were molested as a child or you were raped or, you know what I mean? You were physically abused. Can you please explain trauma uh, to our listeners for people who may not be aware of the scope of what trauma means when it comes to mental health? So everything you expressed is trauma. Trauma is any experience that you've had that has had a negative impact on you, Mm -hmm. right? Whether it be physical, emotional, mental, all of that. But we leave out so many traumas and we we just kind of walk past them. Okay. When I moved here and back here in 2005 at the crisis line in 2006, we took a lot of calls from Hurricane Katrina victims, Mm -hmm. right? So when I talk about trauma, you could have been in a car accident. That is trauma. Um, And we focus so much on the horrible traumas that we forget what trauma is, right? We could relive trauma through grief. I've had Mm -hmm. a client who, you know, uh, she's an adolescent. She found her father deceased, right? So that's trauma, Mm -hmm. right? How do you deal with that on top of grief? So anything that you are struggling with, anything that you have dealt with that has caused some adverse reaction to an event in your life could be trauma. Right. And so you want to definitely, you know, and when we start to talk about mindfulness, you know, we don't always have to focus on our trauma. Mm. How do we process our trauma? And that's right. Trauma, we could go into a whole other podcast talking about. <laughs> right, because that's one thing I was very shocked to learn. I, I was shocked to learn that a trauma that I had that was um, triggering to me was the lack of communication between um, close relations, close family relationships for me. I didn't realize how much of a trigger not having that 
had <laughs> an right. uh, effect on me. And I would never even thought about it as trauma. It's just like, oh, we just can't seem to have a conversation and, and not get heated or not get whatever, or we don't know how to listen, or they don't know how to receive from me, or they didn't know. I didn't realize that that could be trauma. Yeah, and those traumas <laughs> are not, those Those are things that aren't processed. Mm-hmm. So when you think about having happy thoughts and when you think about experiencing something negative, it's easy to process that happy thought. Mm-hmm. You're going to go on, you're going to do the next thing. Those traumatic events, they stick with you until you process them. So when you start to talk about how we communicate culturally, mm-hmm. right? How we communicate in our relationships, how do, what do we learn? You know, until you can process that, those things are going to, you're going to continue to see them in your relationships. You're going to continue to experience them in your communication until you process it and until you are able to process trauma. And that's not to say your trauma will always go away, Mm -hmm. right? I'm I'm not going to forget that I was molested, for example, as a, as a child, unless I suppress it, right? But even in that, that's an issue that needs to be addressed at some point. But what I can do is learn to cope with those triggers, right? And so there are so many interventions and therapy is where you start. You know, we keep a lot locked inside our subconscious, which comes to our conscious mind. Mm -hmm. Um, And when we're not thinking, you know, I'll use the example um, of a, a, suitcase right okay you have this suitcase that you've been carrying since birth right so your mom is sticking you know your first shoes in there and you know your first bib and your rattle and then in in middle school you're putting your favorite pair of i don't know what you wore but i wore troop lamborghinis okay <laughs> they're in my suitcase i wore tree torns <laughs> okay and then when I get to college, you know, I'm stuffing all everything from Freak Nick that I, you know, and, and spring break, and, mm-hmm. you know, and then into my adulthood. But along the way, those traumas that we've had, they're stuffed in there too. And so if we're stuffing and stuffing and stuffing until we can't get anything else in that suitcase, it's going to burst. Mm. the zipper is going to come apart it's going to start falling apart and that's who we are when we don't deal with our traumas right we're triggered you know we don't deal with it and so at some point it's going to come out someplace whether it be in our relationships it's how we show up at work it's how we treat ourselves those things if we don't those are the things that you start to see when you don't um, manage your emotions and, and you're not regulating them and you're still walking in your trauma. Wow. I wish we could get to a space where therapy is just taught as a proactive thing and not a reactive thing, right? Because I, I get it. I, I, I personally think just being a, a Black American, <laughs> you need therapy. <laughs> And yes. being a black American and being a black woman, you need therapy. And being a black woman, a black American, and maybe working in corporate America is one of the, you know, and it's like you could go in so many different directions with that for whatever your path is. And I, and, I, and my hope is that, you know, we'll get to a space where it doesn't have to be just because something happened, but just proactively, sometimes just existing in a space where I know for me getting labeled with a strong title or even what I recognize as what my gifts are you know I've, I know I have the the gift to motivate and encourage and so people will share and talk but just being able to have a biased person <laughs> to talk to because I think sometimes what happens is even when you talk to people that you love who care for you want the best for you they see you in a certain light and so sometimes it's hard for them to receive certain things from you or hear certain things from you so I think just even having that space of someone who doesn't know me (laughs) that can offer or just and what I learned too therapy is a trick too because what I noticed is like they really didn't say anything if you are going to therapy your therapist should not give you advice I've learned that okay but coping skills (laughs) coping skill right you should you should gain your own insight if i were your therapist gina and i'm not and you got because when you're close in family relationships you can't be somebody's therapist i know but 
if I gave you advice, say, you know what, Nicole, that really, that helped me or it did. Mm -hmm. But the advice is not always going to work out for you. It's unethical for a therapist to give you advice. I can recommend some things. I can give you these coping skills, these interventions that are backed in science, okay. you know, um, but for me to give advice, that's com my own judgments are coming out of that. Mm. My own experiences are coming out of that. So you want to shy away from an, uh, a therapist that says, well, my advice is no, no, yeah. not coming from me. Now I can self-disclose information if it's going to benefit you. But when you go to therapy, it has to be about you. So if you're experiencing that, what you just said, mm -hmm. I'm in therapy and I'm just sitting there and I'm talking and then the light bulb goes off, <laughs> you're doing the work. And that's what we as therapists, we need, we want, we we thrive when we see our, our clients gaining insight because that's all it is when you go to therapy. It's now it's time to do the work. You talk about trauma, you talk about depression, you talk about anxiety. You came to see me. I'm going to be like, here you go. Let's see how this works for you after you give me all of the information because I need to meet you where you are in mm -hmm. that space. And that space has to be safe. And I want you to come back. I want you to gravitate to these tools. I want to see some consistency in them. And I want you to thrive. And that's that's kind of the purpose. You know, I just want to take, before we get into the discussion of mindfulness, I really just want to take a moment to shout you out. It's just a, a aura that you exude and just even being able to be your friend and be a sister friend and be in presence when we just chop it up on the phone or have a conversation. I just have learned so much about you and I'm trying not to get emotional. I probably should have waited till <laughs> the end to do this, but you noted about 2016, um, what you were going through. And it's interesting that we connected during that time. 2016 was the hardest um, year I've had in my adult life. It was actually the first year I started <laughs> doing um, therapy. And I really want to celebrate you for a lot of that because just even having conversations with you, talking to you just as a girlfriend and just the suggestions that you made to me to seek out or get or helping me even to realize, because I didn't realize I had my own uh, uh, stereotypes to, to and stigmas to break through. I learned that my strength was really in my vulnerability. I feel like I'm about to cry. Oh my God. Don't cry. Thank you, friend. I love you so much. I love you too. I love you too. Uh, Lisa Johnson, a friend of mine, she was the first part time I ever heard about mindfulness and she was doing a workshop somewhere. I didn't even know what it was. I was just going to support her because she was my friend. <laughs> it was so interesting. It was my first um, introduction. And so I think as a subject, I, I hope that we start to talk more about, I know my friends and I are. And so for anyone who's listening, can you give us an introduction of what mindfulness is? Yes. So I'm going to give you the most elementary okay but it's about the con consistency right okay. so mindfulness is basically being aware being present with your thoughts how you feel your emotions um and how you just are in the moment right we talked about just briefly anxiety so if i'm anxious today i'm either thinking about something in the past Mm -hmm. Like maybe yesterday I didn't get something done or I'm thinking about today is Sunday, one of the most stressful days um, for people because we're thinking about the work week or I'm thinking about this work week. I'm not being present. Right. And so it just takes me away from being in that positive space. Right. We are human. That's number one. And we are not going to be without stress ever. We're always going to have stress and that is fine. You know, we're supposed to have a level of stress. It motivates us, right? If I know I have this big exam coming up, you know, licensure exam or thank God I passed that. But <laughs> if I know that there's going to be a level of stress that motivates me to study, right? But I should not be thinking today about what I'm going to have for lunch tomorrow. I can make my lunch this evening. Or I can make my lunch in the morning. I feel safe. But to ruminate on that, 
that's not being present. Okay. And when you're not present, you miss so much. We have so many life challenges. They're going to be there. Right. It's just very important to understand in the moment I can give myself some reprieve. I can give myself grace and I can be present. Okay. And so mindfulness is just being in a state of awareness and present. How am I feeling? Am I, what are my thoughts right now? Can I, can I pivot from these thoughts right now? That's, that's interesting. Cause I was about to say, like, I, I always like that about you because you always talk in a very elementary way too, when you're talking about, uh, things. And I like that about you because I know that you want people to understand and to get it. And so talk to me about a typical day. It's, it's Sunday morning and I just woke up and it's a presentation I have at work tomorrow. I had a not so great exchange with, uh, you know, a friend last night. And so I'm waking up thinking about the exchange and I'm thinking about like how the presentation is going to be received. If I'm going to get the account, explain how I can at that moment utilize mindfulness tools and what can I do? So the first thing I would do, the first thing I would do in mindfulness is acknowledge how I'm feeling. I'm anxious, okay. right? That is, that's just how I'm feeling. I don't feel good. I'm pissed off at this friend, this exchange last night. I'm so stressed out because of this uh, presentation tomorrow, even though I know I, I got it, but I'm still, you know, a little anxious about it. I need to stop myself and be intentional the first thing i'm going to do is probably a mindful practice so that could be deep breathing i could do some guided imagery i could listen to some type of meditation mm -hmm. and start there if i'm stressing about the exchange with the friend that wasn't good and also stressing about the presentation tomorrow and if i'm going to get the account how <laughs> Am I using guided imagery to assist me with that? So the first thing guided imagery you want to do is raise your vibration. Okay. That's the whole, that's the sole purpose. Okay. Is to raise your vibration. So in raising your vibration, you're going to bring in, bring in all of your five senses. Okay. So I'm going to walk you through how to do this. And eventually you can do it on your own. You'll have a number of events that you've already experienced. Because I like to use experiences that you've had because you can recall, oh, at that birthday party, I was having a time of my life. Okay. On the beach, I could connect, right? Spiritually, maybe. And so you want to connect with an event that you've already experienced and you experience your five senses again. And then when you are done, you should feel calm. You should feel relaxed, rejuvenated, and your energy is high. So your focus isn't on those two outlying situations. Mm -hmm. You're present and you you are able to rise and to bring your vibration up and to raise your energy in that present moment so that that's, those two things aren't your focus, right? You'll eventually get back to that friend and have a conversation and, and maybe mend things sooner than you expect, right? Mm -hmm. That presentation that you are probably overly prepare for you'll you'll knock that out tomorrow right and we could talk about affirmations and all of those things but being present using that particular um technique will raise your mm -hmm. um, vibration raise your energy so that you can kind of focus on what's going on right here it's so interesting that you said that two things came to mind when you said people do these practices every day and don't realize it. I used to have a colleague and when it was like really high um, stress at work, she would have this thing where she would say, I'm going into my office and I'm going to pretend I'm on the beach with a Mai Tai. And I never even, <laughs> it used That's to just it. be funny to me when she said it. You know, once you figure it out, once you, and then the, the other thing to heighten it though, is to bring your senses in. Because one of them is, can you feel, I would ask you, if you were on the beach with a Mai Tai, mm -hmm. I would ask you to kind of like take an assessment of what it was on that particular event that stood out to you. What did you smell? Mm. What did you see? What did you hear? Mm -hmm. If there was anyone else there, what was the conversation about? Did you touch anyone? Mm -hmm. Right? And so my last question is, what emotion did you feel? 
if you were relaxed and at peace and, you know, all those great emotions, I would ask you to tap into that. Try okay. to figure out how to get back to that space. And so if you can start to practice that and actually feel those emotions, those good emotions, those positive emotions, and you were to start to do that consistently, your positivity like vibration would stay on, right? It's almost like shutting the light switch off. Mm -hmm. You know how to turn it on when you need it. That's another tool in your toolbox. Okay. Guided imagery. So I want to ask you this. After I do that, I bring myself there, I still have this issue with the friend. Are you telling me that one of the things about using the mindfulness is that it'll put me at a relaxed mood and take the anxiety away <laughs> so that when it is the time time to have the conversation, maybe I can process better. Maybe it wasn't as deep as what I thought it was, or even if it was, I could come to them in a more relaxed state to have a conversation about it, my approach might be different. So you're definitely cultivating a sense of awareness. Okay. Right. When you're doing this, when you're able to cultivate a sense of awareness. It's almost like you start to regulate your emotions. Okay. And so you walk yourself through that exchange with your friend. And I call hmm. it fact checking. Elementary, again, okay. let's fact check. How did I show up in that particular situation? How did that individual show up? And if you know how to effectively communicate, because not all, not all of us do, if you can effectively communicate, if you can process that situation effectively, then you can go back to that person and show up. Meaning, you know what, Gina, in that exchange, that this is what I did. And I don't feel comfortable, you know, that's not how I wanted to show up in that space. But this is also how I felt. So let's try to resolve that. And that's where that mindful awareness is. We take time, you know, to process, you know, what that looked like for us and what mm -hmm. we want it to look like moving forward. Because we're not as reactive or impulsive. You know, we can kind of sit in whatever that exchange was and show up because sometimes we don't, sometimes we are, you know, we'll have an exchange with someone that has nothing to do with that person. Mm. Right. And so we're bringing in things from work, you projecting. know, this director projecting, mm -hmm. right. That's we directing. do that a lot. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So when we start to um, get a sense of awareness, because through mindfulness, you're going to sit still. You're going to be quiet mm -hmm. with those thoughts that you don't like even. Again, I go back to how how do I take care of myself? Okay. How am I taking? And that's the first step in mindfulness. What are the tools that I need to start, mm -hmm. right? You know, I need some time. I need to check in with myself, right? And be honest and transparent with myself. Mm -hmm. And if you can't be honest and transparent with yourself, you really need to speak with someone. I'm not going to judge this you for that. This is interesting. You shouldn't be judged for that at all. Mm -hmm. But that's a block. And so if you're having a hard time um, kind of breaking through or, or not wanting to deal with a stressor, not wanting to deal with a past situation, again, stuffing it in that suitcase, mm -hmm. you might not be ready but you know that's at the forefront. That's something you should start to tackle. That's really interesting. One of the, I feel like, and I, and I never thought about it that way because you're saying so many things now, so many tools that I have learned, and I didn't realize it contributes to this conversation. And one of the best tools I've learned, because I'm definitely somebody that, is that I still work through, as you know, being impulsive and jumping the gun. I'm so much better because one of the tools that I try to use the most now is the is an accountability measure. And it's always asking myself how might I have contributed to whatever Definitely. happened. And so I sit and reflect on like, was I not in a great mood? Was I, you know, because I, I have a sarcastic nature. So even when I'm saying things sweet, it can sound sarcastic. So I think about, you know, what was my tone like? Did I mean to say that? Was I trying to be sarcastic? Did I, was I not in a great mood? Did I, did I push too hard when they were sharing? And so I feel like, I'm doing a lot better of of doing that because I try to sit in accountability first. And even yes. I noticed that 
when you change things even about yourself, I noticed my conversations like have changed with people and some people like stuff like that and they don't because even now when I talk with friends and people, I'll be like, well, do you think it's anything you could have contributed to the conversation? Do you think you could have, what do you mean? They were just wrong. Like, or, but that's just someplace I try to start because even I realized in talking to the other person, it kind of, when people talk to me, even like that, it kind of puts you, it kind of helps you settle and, and, and bring down the wall when somebody has humility enough to acknowledge what they may not, have done realize being right is not is a, a battle to win like you want to be in a good relationship you don't want to be right and then another thing is just and my friend taught me this actually there's two more two things I, I i do one i got and one she gave to me the first one that i got is it's okay to tell people that you're not in a space to talk if they want to talk about something, because I used to kind of think, oh, it was rude or it's mean, like they're going through. But I really have to assess the mindset or the space that I'm in right now, especially since losing a parent. Since losing a parent and having friends that have lost parents after me, I'm just not in a space sometimes where, and I don't mean for that to come across selfish, but it's just very triggering. And so, it's okay to be honest that you're not in a space. And then the thing that she taught me was when you're about to share something with somebody to think about the level of heaviness that it might be, or if it could be something triggering to their life. So asking, I want to share, I actually had a cousin I, I did I did this with, I got a video and, and her mom's pet, my aunt's passed. And she was in a video when I text, when I sent her a text and I was like, Hey, I got a video and IT is in there. Are you in a space where you can see a video of her right now? And then she responded, absolutely. But I wouldn't have did that if my friend didn't tell me that. Also asking people like, I want to share something with you. It's a little heavy. Do you think you're in a space to hear something like that? right now it's a game changer so that's awareness <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a, a game changer one thing i want to back up to what you said about being selfish selfish is self-care right a lot of people don't like to use the term no because it's definitive it's negative use a different term i'm not available i'm not in a space <laughs> i'm not in that space right being honest and transparent with other people they might not be accepting of it but you are practicing self-care mm -hmm. and that's important in the mental space where you want to show up healthy. So you deprivate self-awareness. Okay. Right. And what that looks like is being able to kind of navigate, like you said, it's, it may, it may take you some time, but getting to a place of understanding where you are. Okay. Right. That might not work for everyone. Mm -hmm. They might not meet you there. But as long as you're doing it for yourself and it's positive, you have to keep doing that because that's where self-care starts. Being able to say, no, having that awareness, this is too heavy. Being on the other side of that and saying, you know what, Nicole, I understand what you're going through right now, but I might not be that person today, right? Let's circle back. Mm -hmm. That's a level of awareness and that, like you, you use the term trigger. We're triggered so much. Right? Mm -hmm. We have between 60 and 70,000 conscious thoughts a day. But then you have this subconscious mind back here. How do you take care of that? Right. You have to start. And so when you start to use these mindfulness, mindfulness practices like yoga, sitting still, any type of exercise, nature, being outside. I don't care if it's raining. I don't care if it's snowing. What just you promote that all the time all to your the friends? Time. <laughs> Go outside. You know, during COVID, we were stuck in the house. I would say seventy percent of my time was spent on my porch, mm -hmm. and I just made that my oasis. Like, figure out what your oasis is. Be present in that space. And so we can talk about journaling. We can talk about affirmations, things that help you cultivate more mindfulness. How about just uh, the breathing and the deep breaths? Deep just, breathing. Oh, Four, man. seven, eight. Inhale, exhale, and hold it. Like, do that. I know I, I talk to, and I teach people breathing techniques all the time. They're like, I know how to breathe. Right. But do you breathe intentionally? intentionally, right? To slow your mind 
uh, because we have all of these like adverse thoughts, thoughts that, you know, you could be singing, you know, your favorite Tina Marie song, right? Come on, girl. <laughs> Square this, who's that? Dance it to the lead. No, go ahead. <laughs> and then a, in a split second, this thought comes in. That happens. Have you a ever lot, been- Nicole. Sometimes I think I'm like, what's wrong with me? I will think about something that happened 20 years ago and start getting mad about it. And I have to stop, like, stop it. Now stop it right now. You're not even upset about that or mad. And it's like out of nowhere. I have not thought about this in 20 years. And it just pops up in the midst of happiness and joy. It's crazy. What have you learned about mindfulness? so far that you have to bring yourself back to that moment self-awareness and also why did that pop up right do i need to think on that or do i just need to try to just let go of it and bring myself back into the present moment how how is it affecting you you just thought about it y'all see what she's doing right they don't give you don't tell you right 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 i think yeah sometimes i worry and this is just a very vulnerable moment sometimes i worry that those things are just meant to come as distractions and I give them too much time. But then I'm also trying to balance, like, is it coming up for a reason? So, you know, I'm too analytical. I know that's what part of my, I'm very analytical. Anybody that knows me knows that. And so sometimes I feel like I can feel a pushing, like, is something I need to acknowledge? And sometimes it's like, "Mm, we're not playing those games today. And get right back to my singing and doing my snake, you know? And that's your pivot. That's your maneuver. Like, that is your fact checking. It did something. I fell off the slide 27 years ago. My cousin pushed me um, off the slide. And today I'm thinking about that. Like, how does that affect me today? Oh, no. You know, a lot of people, I know a lot of people, we have these conversations like, it's not just me. It's not just me. (laughs) Let's talk about 20 years ago, I was molested by my Mm -hmm. uncle and this thought is coming up today. Maybe that's something I need to deal with. Okay. Maybe that's something I'm suppressing. But in that, how is that affecting my relationships? Right. Exactly. Exactly. You know, so not the slide, not the fall, but this heaviness that I kind of see it. Mm -hmm. Not every day, but it's showing up. That might be something that's happened too. When you just talk about the general stresses that we just feel on a daily basis or a a, a normal day, is that the (laughs) first place to start? It's just acknowledging what I'm feeling and then pivoting the tools that I use to pivot from that moment, whether that be um, using the guided imagery, using my breathing, or you know music music is that Prayer. is that what it all comes down to whether whether i was to ask you about couples or if how would couples use mindfulness or parents or individuals it is is it all the same is it all the same here's the thing it is but you can tailor it right so i have a 15 year old which you know your nephew grant hey, grant and my child has become very emotionally intelligent. Okay. And that is because I've tried to foster that, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, when we wake up in the morning, we are not speaking anything negative, but even about school. We'll wait until after school to assess what did what didn't you do today, what needs to be done, because that's how you jumpstart your day. I don't Mm -hmm. need to be yelling at him in the morning about an assignment that wasn't Mm -hmm. done. We'll work on that later because he's going to carry that into his day. Okay. So I want to lead by example, right? And so Grant knows how to meditate. You know, when we get in the car after school, there is no music. There is no phone. We're talking about how our days went. You know, what went well and what didn't go so well. What about that assignment? Mm -hmm. Right. And so we didn't start the day off like that in terms of anything that was negative. Okay. We started off on a positive note and then midway we can assess every, you know, kind of what wasn't, what didn't work so well Mm -hmm. and give ourselves time to get to sleep. Okay. Because we don't even want to take that into sleep. Mm. Right. There should be a sleep regimen that you have for my child. You can't, there's no screen time an hour before bed, Mm -hmm. 
right? We're not scrolling. We're not doing any of that. You might watch a little TV, um, but I, I even kind of want to be intentional about what I watch before bed. Right. We talked about this. I mm-hmm. no longer watch the first 48 before bed, right? That I'm was something my therapist gave me. She told me animation. I'm supposed to watch animation comedy, <laughs> or comedy stories. before bed. Yeah, mm-hmm. those mm-hmm. types of things. But leading by example, even in your relationship, right? Um, I know we're both very spiritual people, um, married for 17 years. My husband, he's not a vocally spiritual person, but he is. Okay. So I can go up to him before I leave in the morning and put my hand on him and pray before we leave. And that gives him some, it, it just gives him something before I leave the house. Yeah, something right? to connect with. I want to step back for a second because you said something and, and I, I, I realized this years ago, but sitting here talking to you. I didn't realize, I, I'm just sitting like, oh, I think that's the first time anxiety showed up in my life. When I was a trans, it was very hard for me transitioning from elementary to junior high school. And I did not want to go to the junior high school uh, I, I was going to. I had so many, I had, uh, I was just so troubled by it. And I was breaking out in hives just random week, week and a half every night. Get up in the middle of the night, go in my parents' room. My mother was sad, rub me down, wake up in the morning, they be gone. This went on and on. So we went, made a doctor's appointment, went to the doctors, and he's just asking my mother all these different questions. Mama's be knowing. And my mom said, let me ask you something. He was like, anything different going on? She was like, she's about to start junior high school. She was really nervous about it. And I remember somewhere in that conversation, I, I think he asked my mom, like, what happened? And she was telling, and he was like, stop talking about it at night before she goes to bed. Don't don't talk about mm-hmm. it anymore at night before you go to bed. And it would come up, my mom be like, we're not talking about that. If you want to talk about, it was almost like it was a time of day, maybe that we address, but we're not talking about that before. It, and it stopped happening. Exactly. It because stopped happening. You those thoughts into sleep and you're not getting into REM sleep. The, the last thoughts that you have before bed, even if you don't, if you can't even recall your dream, your subconscious is thinking about it. Mm-hmm. So you and I know you done meditation before bed, two hour meditation sometimes, but taking those positive thoughts into sleep, you get a, you come out with a better, you get better results. Right. Right. So tomorrow morning, I might feel rejuvenated. Um, And I want to step back for a second because stress and anxiety it, it can show up physically, right? I we, feel like it has a lot in my life, if you want to know the truth. My friends always have a going joke. Every time it's time for me to go on a trip, something major has happened in my life. I'm talking about, like, graduations and things of that nature. It's always like, don't get sick. Don't get sick. And I didn't realize how much of my life I've had. I'm just a very, like... I have been for years. I'm, you know, we're re relearning things now. And I always had, I was always anxious about something before it happened. Like, oh my God, what if I forget my license? Oh my God, what if I get there and I don't have my plane ticket? Oh my God, what if I lose my plane ticket in the bathroom when I'm about? I've always done that to myself. I had always done it to myself over years. And I always ended up sick. Before some finals, when we were at Morris Brown. And mine used to come out of skin. I had eczema. We were mm-hmm. in college. My I, I thought it was normal because my dad suffered from eczema uh, very severely, and it would come in the form of breakouts around my eyes and different things. And I realized when I start, and then it's like when college was done, it didn't happen. And then I went to law school, it started happening again. And right. so, yes, a physical sickness, breakouts, hives, like absolutely. I've seen that hair ulcers. falling out. People develop ulcers. Uh, heart disease, cancer, like stress will literally kill you. And a lot of the stress, again, we bring on ourselves. I'm a witness. Because we're, we have no, we don't have the awareness. Like you use this example before something big, I would just become anxious. You didn't have the tools that you mm-hmm. have now That's right. to practice to help you decrease that anxiety, mm-hmm. right? You know, I might have some anxiety or some, we talked about this earlier in the podcast. Stress is normal, mm-hmm. but it's the level of stress. It is how do we slow our thoughts down in order and to be still to fact check. Now I'm yes. all this stuff together. That's right. So that I understand my body and I can acknowledge this stress may present, 
but is it real? Do I yeah. need eating as a coping mechanism? Let's not. We can have a whole podcast show on that because those are the two things I learned: eating as a yes. coping mechanism and doing a zillion things. I did not even know until I started yeah. therapy. All that you're on this board, you're you're leading this, uh, you're chairing this conference, you're right. doing this, you're doing that, you're starting this, you're doing this project. I didn't realize that those were unhealthy coping coping skills. coping skills, and so even relearning. What are better, you know, coping skills? And even you hear, I have friends talk about like when they get stressed, how much weight they lost. I'm like, I'm on the other end of the spectrum because right. it's wanting to put food right. in my mouth for comfort. And so even still working through those things. And I think that's why mindfulness, if, if nothing else, I want listeners to walk away with like our practices are so important in what we do. Like there are so many areas in your life that all these things could come into. And we just, I feel like my life, I'm just so much happier. This is the freest I've ever been in my life because I'm I'm knocking areas out that I've never knocked areas about. And listen, a hundred more will come out because every day we're learning, we're developing, we're growing, we're addressing things. But I want us just to do better for the generations that are behind us and the model for them how to put these things, you know, these practices into our lives. And, I, and I'm just I'm just thankful for people like you and others who who share and try to share and make people aware. Nicole has a thing, y'all, called Positive Vibes Only. You are not going to get on the phone with her. You cannot sit around and gossip with her. You cannot say it is not allowed. And so I just want to celebrate you for that, friend. Thank you. Yeah, and, and it's not as hard as people think. Um, it does take consistency. I've had a number of clients come to me and I'll just use journaling as an example, okay. right? Mindful, like just spit it out, right? But I've had people journal for years and it has been all negativity, right? And so my question is, how has that served you mm. to document every negative thing in your life? And again, I'm not judging you. Mm -hmm. I want to know how it's helped. And when it hasn't, you wow. So if you have not tried mindfulness, if you have not tried to uh, be more intentional, to be mm -hmm. more aware, mm -hmm. try it. Yeah. Right. Try something different. Because when you start to journal, those clients start to journal only positivity. That's where your focus is. Right. So you're focused on the present moment and you want that moment to be all things positive then that's what it's gonna be because that's your focus i have a friend that journals and she says she needs to do it as a release to get it out and then mm -hmm. she says she goes near a body of water and she rips it up and cuts it up and she's like because i know it's not going to serve me what served me was being able to get it out because I right. needed to put it somewhere, but it's not going to serve me to hold on to this energy. And so I've done what I needed to do. And now I cut it up and I get rid of it because I don't need to hold on to that to go back to it. It was just to get the release. And I'm like, oh, wow, I never thought about it like that. And that is the perfect, uh, I don't want to say intervention, but technique, right? <laughs> when I say your my clients would journal nothing but negativity. And I say, what are you doing with that? And they don't have an answer. Your friend had an answer. Mm -hmm. What am I doing with that? Because a lot of things that we have are stuck up here. Mm -hmm. And journaling helps you get it out. But then there should be something counterproductive to that, if that makes sense. Like, it, does. it shouldn't just be, oh, my journal is full of these negative thoughts. And what are you doing with that? <laughs> right. Let's it makes sense when you out. say it out loud. It makes sense. Right. It makes sense when you say it out loud. I want to take a step back because I, I went back to that, but I would like for you to speak to um, the couples out there and when different things come up in the relationship, how can they use mindfulness in their own practices for the relation to benefit the relationship? So there are two things that I think. One is listening, right? And not just in a sense of, oh, I hear you, I'm listening. <laughs> but again, everything that you've learned today about mindfulness is being aware. Okay. Right? And so when you are mindfully listening, you can be empathetic because people want to be seen, heard, and validated. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not listening to you, then I can't do any of that. I, I can't understand see that. you. 
I can't validate you. I can't mm-hmm. hear you. So when you're in a relationship with someone and you're not, I mean, how often is a relationship like this, right? Mm-hmm. It's going to be off balance more than there is balance, but you have to process what that looks like. Mm-hmm. So if we're in a relationship and we just had this big argument, right? About, I don't know, dinner. And you don't want Chinese, but I want Korean barbecue. I mean, first of all, let's sit down. Maybe I don't want Chinese, Gina, because we had it three days last week. So there has to be some compromise in that. Mm -hmm. And then what is our process for communicating effectively, right? I might be the type of person who, if we're having a disagreement, Mm -hmm. I might need five minutes. I may mm-hmm. need 20 minutes. You as my partner have to understand. I'm ready. Let's get in there. Like, <laughs> right. You as my partner has to understand, but we won't have that understanding unless we're listening and communicating mm-hmm. and we understand what our processes are. I believe there has to be rules of engagement in a relationship, right? Rules? Yes. How do we engage? How are you not going to talk to me? Right. Mm-hmm. What does respect look like? And so when we're aware of she's a therapist, you guys, but if you could have saw how that neck just rolled when she said, How are you not gonna talk to me? Uh-huh, that's a sister. How are you not going to talk to me? But you know, when you when you start to bring all of this awareness into your relationship, I'm aware that my partner might need to take an hour before we come back to this conversation. I'm going to give my partner that grace. But my partner has to understand that this conversation has to finish. We have to end this conversation. We have to resolve it. And so that's how you start to become very mindful in the relationship. Um, And then just creating rituals together, right? What do we do together? Are we praying together? Are we exercising together? Are you my accountability partner if you don't want to exercise with me? And that doesn't mean telling me what I should be doing. Okay. But showing up for me when I need you. So, you know, those rituals, maybe we sit down. Um, to have dinner together once a week with no devices, right? That is very unusual in a lot of relationships. If it's not, what are you doing when you're sitting together? Are you talking, having a mean, meaning conversation? You no, know, are we taking walks in the park together? Are we sitting on the porch together? You know, what could we do together to bring more awareness just to communicate effectively? Okay. And be more mindful for one another. Okay. I love this, Nicole. You know I could talk to you all day long. And so I do want to shout you out for a minute because if you are watching and you see us wearing our upscale weirdo, I love if if you're listening to Nicole, you can hear um just the genuineness in her, how she is. She has always authentically and unapologetically lived how she lives, dresses how she dresses, and has embodied that in a clothing line called Upscale Weirdo. And so I would love if you would share with the listeners what is the theme model behind um, your clothing brand, Upscale Weirdo. Upscale Weirdo, um, I do believe in... Being who I am authentically, scale weirdo embodies is just being who you are, not having to answer to anyone's, uh, not, not just society, but those people closest to us, mm. right? Sometimes we have to show up, like we talked about earlier, in their space, mm-hmm. not being who we are, but being who they need us to be. Mm. So when you encapsulate being an upscale weirdo, you know, weird is just different. It's who you are. It's who you are today. Mm-hmm. Tomorrow, you know, I wore a, um, a beanie last week, Gina, with a, a veil on it to an outdoor festival. <laughs> and, you know, I got so many compliments. And by the end of the night, I no longer have it. I gave it away. I mean, of course I you did. That is so your personality, it. friend. But it it's just it just brings awareness to being who you are authentically. Mm-hmm. Weird is not a negative term. That's right? right. Weird is everything positive. It is different. It is okay to be who you are. So when you wear my clothing line, you're saying to people like 
who co- who will definitely come up to you and say, what's well, upscale weirdo? Right. You know, you just explain to them, like I'm explaining to you, it is being authentically who you are mm-hmm. and first knowing who you are. Right. Like being confident in your quirkiness. Mm-hmm. It's important to understand who you are, acknowledge your quirkiness, um, your differences. It is okay. My favorite affirmation for myself is I am the exception. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that Gina's not the exception, but in my uniqueness and my weirdo, I am the exception. And so I stand in that. I walk in that. I live that. And so I am an upscale weirdo. I love it. I love it. Well, Nicole Bartel, I have enjoyed this time. I'm definitely thinking about something um, where you can come back. I love this topic. I love this conversation. I, I want our community to have as much information and tools as possible. It's just about using that. But before I let you go, there is something that you would like to offer to the listeners. And so I want to give you an opportunity to share that now. Yes. I would like to offer three listeners uh, a 45 minute session to teach mindfulness. So the first three individuals who reach out to me via DM, we can set up a time for 45 minutes and I'll try to walk you through, through about three three practices for meditation and mindfulness. And um, hopefully this will get you started on the, a new path of being present. And oh, aware. appreciate that. I love that. So guys, <laughs> her Instagram is Nicole Bartel. That, so that's N-I-C-O-L-E. B-A-R-T-E-L-L-T-H-A-T. Nicole Bartell, that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I just want you to offer one thought to our listeners as we close out this session. Is being aware. And a lot of times uh, we're not intentional. And so once you become intentional about being aware, you have so much more control over your thoughts, your feelings, and your emotions. And that is all about emotional regulation. Let's cheers it up. I appreciate you. Cheers. Cheers. Well, there you have it. Another episode. I hope that you guys really enjoy Nicole. I love just learning about topics that make us better as people. Hope we all take away uh, small things and changes that we can make uh, in our life just to practice our own mindfulness. A lot that we already do, but just honing in on it more. And so I hope you enjoy the episodes. Uh, be sure to reach out, check in with us on Instagram at Sippy Talk Podcast. Life is too short for bad vibes and bad drinks. So keep sipping, keep chatting, and always remember life is a journey, but it's better with a sip and a chat. Until next time, cheers. Thank you, sippers, for joining the Sip Podcast, where we sip, eat, talk. If you've enjoyed our flavorful conversations, don't miss out on future episodes. Subscribe now and follow us on Instagram at YouTube at Sip, Eat, Talk Podcast. Let's continue to sip, eat, and talk together. Until next time, cheers.